Representative Richie Torres, it's so nice to talk to you. How are you? How are you doing? And you know, people usually say that, but they don't like mean it, mean it. But boy, you've had a busy three weeks in Congress. <laughs> Inauguration. Uh, someone tried to take over the Capitol. Uh, you're in the middle of a global pandemic. So how, how are you really doing? If, 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 if someone had said to me a year ago that I would become a member of Congress during an infectious disease outbreak, that I would witness an insurrection against the United States Capitol during the electoral ballot vote count, and that I would then vote to impeach Donald Trump toward the end of his term, I would have said that sounds like a movie. It sounds fantastical. And you know, my first Wednesday, I'm witnessing an insurrection. My second Wednesday, I'm voting to impeach Donald Trump. And my third Wednesday, I'm witnessing the inauguration of President Joe Biden and Vice President Kamala Harris. Uh, life never unfolds as you imagine. I'm looking forward to what happens next Wednesday. It's like yeah. I'm on the edge of my seat. Um, let's talk a little bit about the inauguration. Give me a sense. I mean, obviously, unity was the theme. No surprise there. Uh, our our poet laureate, who was wonderful, uh, talked really about unity. Everybody who got up talked about unity. All the songs were about unity. President Biden's uh, speech was about unity. Um, what was your take on the entire day? It, it was an emotionally overwhelming experience for me because it was the first inauguration that I had seen in person. And for me, you know, I juxtapose the siege on the Capitol with the inauguration, because those two events capture the two competing realities in America. It is the reality of America emerging as a multi-ethnic, multi-racial, inclusive uh, democracy. Uh, and for proof, look no further than the Democratic caucus in the House, 70% people of color, women, members of the LGBTQ community. But then there's the reality of white supremacy the backlash against multiracial democracy. The siege on the Capitol was not simply a violent structure. It was a violent assault on the very idea of multiracial democracy. And, and we saw that idea come powerfully to light during the inauguration. Um, you know, as a proud Af uh, Afro uh, Bronxite, uh, I took pride in seeing uh, J-Lo and, and Sonia Sotomayor, both Boricua and both uh, products of the Bronx. And the image of Kamala Harris, the first woman, the first African-American, the first Asian-American in the vice presidency, being sworn in by Sonia Sotomayor, the first Latina on the Supreme Court, that to me is a powerful distillation of America as a multiracial democracy. And it was a powerful reminder that the future does not belong to Donald Trump and the violent white supremacy that he has unleashed. Uh, the future belongs to multiracial democracy. I believe that. Secretary of State, the former Secretary of State, uh, Pompeo, uh, said multiculturalism is not who America is, which outside of being a horrifically, grammatically weird sentence, uh, I think is also wrong. I mean, I think America takes it very seriously. It's pride in being a melting pot, right? We all learn about that in fourth grade and beyond. Uh, and it's clear that in um, diplomats of color have been passed over or pressured to resign or, have, you know, sort of been reassigned. Uh, so it's obviously been a bit of a challenge for those folks who are people of color who were working under him. He's gone now. Um, President Trump had 74 million people who supported his candidacy. And so I always wonder, it's not a fringe, it's not a, a group that you can say, hey, listen, that's you can, you know, easily ignorable. What do you do about those folks, many of whom I think really do support a lot of the president's um, ideas around uh, race. I think he's was clearly a, a bigot and was from the day one. Uh, I don't think everybody, and certainly I've met lots of people who are interested in the president, uh, Trump's uh, economic policies, et cetera, et cetera. But I'm always 
I, I, what do you do with 74 million people who were willing to support somebody who was overtly a bigot and, and not ashamed of being one? Racism is much deeper in America than I thought. You know, like many, I expected a democratic sweep. You know, I said to myself, we have the worst infectious disease outbreak in a century. We have the worst economy in a century. Uh, and we have a president who's just a public relations debacle. You know, Biden is going to win overwhelmingly, and the Democrats are going to sweep the House. And, and quite the contrary, we actually lost seats in the House because of the Trump surge. And even though Biden won the popular vote decisively, he won the Electoral College in the key swing states uh, at the margins. So that speaks to the depth of white supremacy in our society. You know, I'm convinced only Biden could have defeated Donald Trump among the Democratic nominees. Why do you say that? Because he, he, he won just enough white working class votes to make a difference. Scranton, um, Scranton coming through. Just, just enough. Um, but even, even, even if we had Biden Democratic nominee, but for the pandemic, it's clear to me Trump would have won. Or what if he had sent out a stimulus check the week before the election? He might have won. I mean, that's how. Or just not been crazy, right? I mean, to some degree, it was such an undisciplined, disorganized. You had more white supremacy. Uh, he, he could have managed to achieve a second term. So I think we have to be careful not to declare a mission accomplished. Uh, because Trump displayed far more strength. Um, than he should have. And, and even after the siege on the Capitol, even after Republicans like Mitch McConnell acknowledged that Donald Trump incited the siege, only 10 Republicans in the House voted to impeach Donald Trump. So he has a profound hold on the psyche of the Republican Party and the Republican base. Where does that go in your estimation, right? There are some people who are declaring the death of the Republican Party, which I don't think is accurate. And there are some people who are saying, listen, he's sowing the seeds for Ivanka Trump to come and be president one day. And I, I don't think that's accurate either. I think he's a very unusual and particular kind of candidate that sells. It doesn't necessarily translate to his children um, in the way they would need to be able to take advantage of, uh, to, to run for office um, and, and, and sort of get the same support. Everybody talked about unity, but I don't know how you unify around a party that doesn't very clearly say, we wanna stamp out white supremacy. How do you do that? These are your colleagues now. No, it's, it's a fair point. Um... You know, Donald Trump has unleashed violent white nationalism in our society. You know, for me, politics is meant to be an alternative to violence. Like, politics is about the resolution of our differences, the resolution of conflict through means other than violence. And when you cause your supporters to lose trust in the legitimacy of democratic politics, as Donald Trump has done, you're inviting those supporters to resort to violence. And there are, we know that there are attempts by white supremacist organizations to do harm to the president and to do and members of Congress. And there's no reason to think that those attempts are going to magically disappear after the inauguration. So I fear that the violent white nationalism that Donald Trump has unleashed that will unlast, that would outlast him uh, is going to become a fact of life in American politics. You know, to your point about unity, Biden, touched heavily on the theme of unity. He said the story of America depends not on one of us, not on some of us, but on all of us. We have to, you know, we the people, we have to end the uncivil war between Republicans and Democrats. And it was reminiscent of then candidate Barack Obama's speech in the 2004 Democratic Convention. But it, I feel like it's gonna be received differently. I'm receiving it differently than I did in 2004. Because- Differently how? Because I have, take my experience with the congressman, there are Republicans in the House who voted to overturn the results of the presidential election. 
there are Republicans who incited a violent mob to storm the Capitol, resulting in the murder of a police officer. And then there are Republicans who might have gone beyond incitement and actively aided and abetted the insurrection against the U.S. Capitol. I'm a pragmatist. It's in my nature to find common ground and coalition wherever possible. Yeah, how do you find common ground in someone who maybe incited violence against you and others? And I, I'm going to guess with that crowd, so, you would not have been particularly safe no. uh, had that crowd actually been able to make its way uh, to find um, elected officials. It was to assassinate members of Congress and members of a particular color and a particular creed. Uh, I'm convinced. So, you know, President Biden is calling for unity, but. The, the question I would ask, is unity even possible? Is it even desirable? Like if, if I have Republican colleagues who have no regard for democracy, no regard for the peaceful transfer of power upon which democracy depends, no regard for truth and facts and reason, there's no basis on which to build unity. I'm waiting for the but, because his entire speech said, but we cannot be uncivil, but we cannot live in outrage, but we have to be good neighbors, but we cannot be wading knee deep in anger day in and day out. Uh, I mean, that's my challenge with the speech. I mean, I have deep, deep respect for Joe Biden, but it, 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 it reminds me of then candidate Barack Obama's speech in 2004, and I feel like it, 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 it no longer, what the Republicans, the disagreement we have with Republicans is not about tax rates. It's not about particular social programs. It's about first principles. Like we've seen on the part of the Republican party, a willingness to sacrifice everything, the separation of powers, the peaceful transfer of power, the constitution on the altar of Donald Trump. That's not something we can overlook as an acceptable disagreement. Yeah, I, I'm completely with you on that. And I think it's it's hard to think about unity. I mean, eight of, I think it was eight by my count when I was watching, of the Congress members who were there attending were those who were voting to not count the electors for now President Biden. <laughs> So it's well, it's, it's a little tricky, and it I, and I understand that speeches right are flowery and their goals and their values and they're forward looking, um, but I I do wonder how how do you, how, how so give me an, an answer of how you negotiate navigate and work with a, a you know Congress members who who might you know be trying to take the message of Donald Trump. Uh, and and really bring it maybe one day into someone smarter and and more disciplined and less nutty. Um, and less, you know, I mean, Donald Trump's one of his major issues, I think, was that he would often just talk specifically about all the things that he was planning to do. He's very overt about it, right? His his people would have to try to clean it up and then he'd come out and give a talk and say exactly what everybody thought he was saying. Um, how do you work as colleagues with people like that in Congress? Well, the, 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 the opposites are the easiest cases, right? So there are the Republicans who voted to uphold the Electoral College. Peter Meyer from Michigan, right? I could easily collaborate with him in the service of common ground. Um, and then there are the Republicans who actively aided and abetted the insurrection. Insurrection, as far as I'm concerned, those Republicans should be expelled. Right? Do you so, think they will be? I'm skeptical. <laughs> um, but for me, it's there are clear grounds for expulsion. The question is, what do you do with the, I think it was about half of the Republican conference that voted to overturn the election in the House. You know, that's, what do you do with those Republicans? Because it's half of the party within the House. Um, You're asking me the questions, <laughs> and I'm asking you, yeah, yes. Uh, what do you do? I, I don't think that's a forgivable offense. Like even though, even if they, even if you did not aid the insurrection and even if not incite the insurrection, the fact that you were willing to abuse your office to delegitimize an election, uh, is disqualified. It means you should be persona non grata. Uh, and so that's where I am. I, I, I'm only willing to collaborate with Republicans 
who, 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 who were willing to stand up to Donald Trump and stand up for democracy and stand up for the peaceful transfer of power. You're black, you're Latino, you're gay. What, what caucus, as you know, in the past, right, what caucus you join um, sometimes is an issue. There's not a lot of overlap with the black caucus and the Hispanic caucus, which is so weird. Again, I, I fully understand there's a whole bunch of people that don't even understand that black Hispanic people exist, like that Afro-Latinos are a thing, which is always amazing to me since my mother was an Afro-Latina from Cuba. Uh, but whatever, that might just be poor education in and a poor exposure to other people in America. Um, what sorts of things do you think you'll be navigating outside of dealing with your insurrectionist supporting colleagues in Congress? Um, you're a little bit of a unicorn at this point. Is that good? Is that bad? Is that weird? And and how do you navigate that? It's both both a blessing and, and a burden. Um, but I'm a living challenge to these artificial binary categories uh, that we've imposed on people. Um, the conventional wisdom held that you can either be Latino or Black, but you can never be both. And that binary conception ignores the complexity of how people experience identity in the real world, right? Identity is intersectional, not binary. And one powerful example is Kamala Harris. She's not only black, she's Asian. She's a woman. She has layers and layers of identity. And we now have a person of intersecting identity serving in the second highest office in the United States. So she's a living, she's living proof as I am. That, that identity is complex, and it's intersectional, and it defies uh, the artificial categorization that has been imposed on all of us. I've always felt, I mean, people sort of colloquially say, if you can see it, you can be it, which I think has some validity to it. But there is something about sort of, I, I do think there is a tremendous amount of pride in seeing someone who's kind of like you, whether it's, yeah. I'm from Long Island, they're from Long Island, uh, they're uh, Afro-Latino and I'm Afro, you know, whatever. Uh, I do think there is some sort of connective tissue that at the very least you feel camaraderie with someone, maybe at the, at the most you feel like, wow, this has paved a path that I could then take. Um, have, have you felt that way? Yes, and, and, and I often, hear stories of people who have been inspired by my example. Um, you know, there are communities that have felt historically alienated from the political process. And there are young Latinos of color, Blacks of um, LGBTQ African Americans, LGBTQ Latinos, or LGBTQ youth in general who see themselves in me, who see themselves in, elect in their elected leadership, and who feel inspired to become politically engaged or to run for public office. Uh, but for me, especially as a gay man, you know, visibility is, is a matter of not only of pride, but, but life and death. Um, you know, I'm reminded of the AIDS crisis when the LGBTQ community was far less visible than it is now. Ronald Reagan, the president of the United States, went six years without even uttering the word AIDS, without even acknowledging mass suffering and deaths among LGBTQ people who were dying at the hands of an infectious disease. And for me, the lesson learned from the AIDS crisis is that when a community is invisible, when people cannot see your humanity, the end results can be um, the kind of mass deep suffering that we saw during the AIDS crisis. Uh, so for me, visibility is is our salvation. It's, it's a matter of life and death. And I think of it as much of a blessing as it is a burden. And for me, the process of coming out, the integrity that it demands from you has taught me a, an ethic of radical authenticity. You have big political ambitions. I read you'd like to be the mayor of New York City one day. No, I never, no, no, no. I, 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 is that a lie? Uh, what? Okay. Google was wrong? What? I'm shocked. <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm, I'm open to exploring it, but 
Uh, see, that's that is a yes. Then let me. T I've been in this business a minute. Let me tell you. Unless you say, "Oh gosh, absolutely not," and even then, an absolutely not is translates to a kind of maybe. So uh, I'm open to exploring it. Is yes, I will be running pretty soon. Actually, uh, no, I, I, I'm being sincere. I feel like it is a mistake to overcalculate. They could mm -hmm. never know where life is going to take you. You know, I can, I might love Congress so much that I might want to have a career in Washington, D.C., or I might dread it so much I want to go elsewhere. I just, you know, there's no telling uh, where life is going to take me. And, and my philosophy is that you focus on the governing rather than the politics. Mm -hmm. If you govern successfully, people are going to want you to succeed. People are going to want you to rise to the next level. So I never overcalculate. I never obsess about the politics. I, I try to be the best. I'm trying to be the best congressman that I can be, just like I try to be the best council member that I can be in New York City. Politics creates strange bedfellows. I think that's a quote that someone said before me. But one thing that I've always found very challenging, and I will use Bloomberg as an example, uh, when he was running for the presidency, it was so distressing and disturbing to me. And I, I actually, I like Mike Bloomberg. I sat next to him at way too many dinners. And and I think what he does philanthropically is great. And I actually thought he did some good things as mayor of New York City. But boy, did he really struggle to say, yes, on stop and frisk. I fucked it up. Like, I, I did it wrong. I, and, and I, I... <laughs> maybe very Cuban of me, <laughs> like, like, I really have a hard time when people cannot admit their errors and their mistakes. Like, I don't want to support them in elected office. This is why I will never run, because I think you need to have more than your spouse and your mom and dad love you and want to vote for you. But but this has been a real challenge for me. H how do you do it? Because I think to be successful in politics, you you have to embrace people who you feel like have some failures that they don't want to admit to. Rahm Emanuel is another. I think he did some things well. And I think certainly when it come to, came to criminal justice in Chicago, terrible, bad, uh, bad. Yeah, no, I, I agree with you. We're all complicated people. Not, not very few of us are either purely evil or purely good. Um, we're, we're all as morally complicated as reality itself but but i agree with you there our political culture treats acknowledging error or acknowledging frailty as a sign of weakness and and this is only slightly related but to my earlier point about radical authenticity you know it came as a shock to people that that i i speak so openly about my own struggles with depression um because it's so unusual for elected officials to speak about their own depression, my own psychiatric hospitalization, my own attempts at suicide. Uh, because for many people, it's, oh, that's a sign of weakness. That's a sign that there's something wrong with you. I, I see it differently. I, I think it's a sign that I'm human and authentic, and I'm willing to share my struggles in the hopes of inspiring others. Um, so I, I've seen that, where, where any acknowledgement of error or frailty is is seen as as weakness and but i feel like we're we're moving away from that and the next generation of elected officials are much more accessible much more authentic uh than the generation before we're much more open yeah you're 32 years old is that right 32 32 right so I, I do i think it is a generational thing i think it's i used to be so frustrated with mayor bloomberg when he'd say you know no nobody ever really asked me about stop and frisk i'm like what <laughs> I mean, like some of these things he said were lit, bold faced lies. That's there's no other nicer way to put it. Just a complete and a absolute fabrication. And and it was it was disappointing. I know I lose you in a couple of minutes because you've got things to do. Um, it's been a busy couple of weeks for you. Are you optimistic? You know, inaugurations are nice and they're beautiful. And, and I love ceremony. I love any ceremony that's on the Capitol steps. How can you hate that? But I, I don't. It's been a rough four years. Are you optimistic? Are you hesitantly optimistic? Are you cautiously feeling... optimistic? Hmm? I'm cautiously optimistic. I'm cautiously optimistic. Uh, optimistic because with a Democratic president and a Democratic Senate and a Democratic House, we could have the makings of the FDR moment. We could have a historic opportunity to govern as boldly in the 21st century as FDR did in the 20th century. 
And, and there's more consensus within the Democratic Party than people fully appreciate. Every Democrat voted to impeach Donald Trump. Nearly every Democrat voted to for the $2,000 stimulus checks. Every Democrat or nearly every Democrat voted for COVID relief packages and will vote for a future COVID relief package and a future infrastructure package. So there's extraordinary agreement within the Democratic Party on, on core issues that will lift the lives of, 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 of everyday Americans. Um, what, what the source of pessimism is the depth of Trumpism in, in Republican Party and American politics. The Donald Trump's legacy on the Supreme Court, um, you know, what good is Democratic majorities in the House, Senate, and the presidency if our progressive priorities can be overturned by right-wing judicial activism on the Supreme Court, uh, which is why I strongly support expanding the court, at least reclaiming the seat that was stolen from us. Uh, so the Supreme Court is cause for concern, the staying power of Trumpism, white nationalism is cause for concern. But I'll echo what I said earlier. I, I'm confident that the future belongs to us. It belongs to multiracial, multi-ethnic, inclusive democracy. Regardless of what the former Secretary Pompeo says. Richie Torres represents the 15th Congressional District of New York. It's so nice to talk to you, and thank you for, for taking time out. I know t today is, and as you said, every Wednesday a lot happens, so this is, a, this is a Wednesday that we're recording this, so I appreciate all your time. Thank you. It was a pleasure to be here. Take thank care. You. Thank you.